Uh, my name is Jason Mitchell. I work in the 3D Application Research Group. And today I'm going to talk about a very common visual effect that you see in games, uh, but which no one really talks about. It seems like everyone kind of tries to do this to varying uh, degrees of success. success. Uh, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about what people generally do to, to render light shafts in their, in their scenes uh, and present uh, something that might be a novel way to do it uh, that, that you haven't seen before. Um, we'll, uh, we'll look at a couple quick examples of how this is used in other media and then go into this real-time technique that, uh, that I've, I've implemented based on some things that are, have existed before in the literature uh, that actually are kind of rooted in uh, medical volume visualization techniques. So what is it that we're actually talking about in the first place? Uh, if you look back at the title slide, you'll kind of see what I'm getting at. Uh, this sort of, uh, you know, this look that you get when light is bouncing and scattering off of, of dust or particles that exist in the air. I mean, we don't, we don't see beams of light. We just see light that enters our eye. So what we're seeing is light scattering off of dust or, or mist or something that exists uh, in, in the air that's, that's scattering, the, scattering the light back. Um, shadows in this scenario look really great. Uh, they're, they're a common way to introduce some interesting drama to a scene. It's something you commonly see uh, in movies. People do this all the time in kind of like intro uh, logos for, for companies and for movie titles and things like that. And as it turns out, there's actually some academic uh, research in this area. Uh, you see this all the time in stage lighting. Um, having done some work on, you know, doing this recently, I'm like completely obsessed with this. So, you know, I was noticing this in recent uh, presentations across the street in the Civic Auditorium. Uh, like, for example, at the award shows last night, they had a lot of lights that were just simply placed uh, in, in there. They weren't lighting anything in, in an interesting way on the stage. They just were uh, causing light to scatter off of smoke and, and just sort of particles that were in the air. And it gives you this, this really interesting kind of look around the stage. And likewise, you can kind of think, the, think of these as a distant decoration uh, in your scene. You don't have to worry about necessarily even lighting your characters with them, let alone uh, casting shadows necessarily. Uh, they also, of course, exist on a very large scale as well. I mean, some, these are probably many, some of those miles, miles long in the sky. Uh, you'll, you'll see these in, in Final Fantasy, for example, just as little kind of uh, non-shadowing kind of decorative things that maybe go out a foot before they attenuate completely. And uh, practically every game does this, as I said, with uh, varying degrees of success. Um, here's some examples that I've noticed recently that are kind of um, worth looking at. Uh, Zelda, the Wind Waker, Splinter Cell, which does a particularly good job. Uh, Tomb Raider, the recent Tomb Raider, and Eco. Um, here's, here's some, some shots from Zelda the Wind Waker. Um, you can kind of see when, when he opens up, when uh, Link opens up that uh, treasure chest, a, a bunch of light comes out. And the idea is that it's, of course, scattering off the, the, the particles in the air and scattering back to your eye. Uh, well, what are they doing in that? Probably the simplest thing you could do, which is just a bunch of additive blend, additively blended polygons that are kind of extruded out of that box shape. Um, and maybe a few other ones kind of thrown in there for some flavor and complexity. Uh, they're drawn last and z-buffered against the scene, uh, they, and they attenuate them a little bit just so they can kind of fade out as, as you go. Uh, distance attenuation is something we naturally do with lights anyways. Um, it's a natural property, of, of course, of, of, of lighting just as the light kind of, just, you know, the solid angle of the light kind of gets smaller sort of as you get further away from it anyway, so it kind of naturally attenuates for some given size of thing. Um, so that, that's just a natural property. But also, of course, it's an efficiency win, too, right? It, you know, the, the quicker you attenuate out, the, the less uh, of your world you have to light with a particular light. So that's, that's, a, that's kind of a, an important thing in real-time games. Uh, an artifact, of course, that you see when you do this is the fact that because those, those light shaft extruded polys are z-buffered against the scene, you can kind of, kind of see the funny contours along the side of Link's head there um, that are just... just um, a natural side effect of the way that they implemented this. Uh, Tomb Raider Angel of Darkness has some really neat uh, effects like this as well in it. Um, I actually, I don't really know what they're doing, but to me it looks a little bit more particle based. Uh, it seems like they're probably just, they're, they're lining up a lot of particles kind of in these cone shapes and, and additively blending them together and they give you a pretty convincing effect as well. Um, Eco does some of this. It's a little more subtle and it, and it kind of uh, 
also sort of sometimes just kind of tends to blend with their really oversaturated look that they get anyways in this game. But they're, they're definitely doing something similar to this. Um, Splinter Cell is a game uh, that does this, I think, particularly well. Um, and here's an overhead shot as well. You can see the light streaming in. And you can also see that the character is, seems to be casting a shadow um, there as well. So as he, as he walks through there, he's actually blocking light from reaching some of the particles that are behind him, and hence light's not scattering off of them back to your eye. So how are these generally drawn? Most games will extrude some kind of, kind of a hole shape uh, of a light source or a window shape or something like that. Uh, depending on the angle of the, the, the viewing angle of the player relative to this extruded shape, it may or may not look convincing. I'm sure you've all played games where you've gone and kind of looked up one of these things and kind of at, like, at the window and seen kind of the, an edge of the box clip on your front clipping plane, and it just kind of breaks. Um, it, it's, it's also, it's, it also is kind of difficult to give a really volumetric feel, because as you move relative to these things, you don't get a, real, a really great sense of motion parallax. And, uh, and if you do, you're generally, the motion parallax gives away the game and tells you that it's just kind of a box or a sort of pyramid shape. And uh, with, with particles or with, uh, with these kind of extruded hull shapes, it's difficult to really get decent shadowing. Uh, they can look okay if they're faint enough, uh, but they don't really, like I said, give, a, give much of a volumetric feel. A lot, of, a lot of games will draw something that looks something like this. Uh, to kind of take it maybe a step further, they'll maybe dice it up a little bit um, in each of those three dimensions. It's basically a, kind of a pyramid shape because, you know, the light, depending on sort of where the imaginary light source is beyond that window, that, you know, that those rays may really splay out if it's close or maybe pretty much parallel if the light source is really far away. Um, it's... There, there are some techniques which kind of try to draw the hull of a volume of particles uh, or particulate matter that's basically uniform internally, so like a kind of a, a cloud or some low-lying fog or something like that, and then uh, maybe do some interesting additive and subtractive tricks to that are kind of similar to the way stencil shadow volumes work to kind of determine um, kind of in out and like sort of if, uh, for a given ray that is a given pixel on the screen how many times would a ray through that pixel from your eye kind of go through that volume and ultimately how long was that ray inside the volume and what, is the, what does that tell you well that tells you potentially how much light would have scattered back at your eye from there so you kind of de de determine brightness by kind of adding and subtracting distances of the, the, the uh, front and back facing polygons that make up the shape of this volumetric thing um, there was a Journal of Graphics Tools article by Radomir Mech on this a couple of years ago. Um, those are, those are kind of hard to find. Those aren't usually online, so you kind of have to find somebody that has that, that journal to get those articles usually. Uh, and Greg James had an article in Shader X2 and also in the uh, GDC uh, Direct3D tutorial last year on uh, some, some neat ways to um, make the best use of precision and just implementation details on these kind of hull techniques. They're, they're kind of cool. Um, but in, instead, I'm going to discuss a technique which is based on uh, slice-based uh, volume rendering, which is something you'll see if you look at uh, the visualization community, uh, like, like any IEEE viz conference proceedings or um, any medical volume visualization literature. Um, and as it turns out, uh, some researchers at Hokkaido University, uh, Debashi and Nishita, have applied this approach that's used in the medical community to this approach, to, to this problem, that is, uh, rendering uh, light shafts. And I'm going to present an implementation which is based on the work of Debashi and Nishita, but which ex extends it in a few, a few ways. Um, basically, taking advantage of, of just the newer hardware that's come on the market since they, since they published their work. Uh, here's a screenshot of some of their results. Uh, and you can see that in this sort of church setting here, they have this stained glass window, uh, and, and there, there are these nice colored light shafts coming down from the window. Um, here's another angle on that scene as well. Uh, and you, as you could imagine, the, the techniques that, that kind of try to model a, a volume of particles and, and add and subtract front faces and back faces wouldn't really have a hope of capturing the color um, that's coming in, or the, color, the coloring of those light streaks that you get when you have a stained glass window like this, or maybe a, a colored, a colored um, texture to ask, act as a cookie, like you might have in a, uh, like a, a stage lighting kind of scenario. 
So what are we going to do to, to try to essentially reconstruct this volume of data? In our case, it's not an MRI of some guy's head. It's actually just more or less a cone or just a, a volume of, of light, of lit particles. But it's still this, the same idea of reconstructing this volume data. Um, we, what we're going to do is, here on the bottom right, we see the R, our eye. Um, next to that, we have the screen. That we're, or the, think about it, uh, the, basically, that's your screen, basically. Behind that, in view space, we have these sampling planes. Uh, in the sample application that I'll show you in a second, uh, I'm drawing 100 of these planes. Uh, and so each of those planes uh, has, uh, say, a light, a light map, kind of a spotlight shape, uh, projected onto it. So those, those, those planes are shaded in light space. And they're additively blended with the frame buffer so that for each ray that comes out through our eye there through a given pixel, we are going to add up the intersection, add, add up the, the uh, result of our shader um, at each of those positions in space, uh, say, 100 times for each ray because there's 100 uh, hundred planes that we're drawing there. So we're discreetly sampling along that ray to approximate in, the integral along that ray. Why, right? We want to sum up how much light is scattering back along that ray through that pixel to our eye. That's, that's the, the, really the fundamental deal. Um, so here's, here's a quick screenshot of results, and I'll switch over to the demo box and show you the um, results in action. So you can, you, can, uh, you can kind of see what's going on there. Uh, I've kind of frozen the animation of the light, but, and I have some, some, some neat kind of variation going on there uh, to uh, give you a sense that, that that density of the particles in the air is not uniform. There's actually like bits of, of dust kind of maybe, m maybe moving through the air there and causing streaks, streaks behind it. I, I hope that's perceptible from the audience there. It's, it's designed to be a little bit subtle. And if I, if I turn the light back on again, um, you can see, you know, you can see, you can see, you get a pretty good sense of parallax there, but that it really feels like a volume that's getting lit. Okay, so uh, now I'll talk about some implementation details about how, we, how we've done this and, and some of the little variables that we've got to kind of tweak the look of this thing. Um, first things first, we have to position our sampling planes in space. So what I do is just compute um, the, the eye space bounding volume of the light frustum. And I'll show you what the light frustum looks like. It's basically basically what you would expect. If you were rendering the scene from that point of view, that would be your little your view frustum. And that's something, of course, you could, you could tune to make a, a tight little uh, flashlight or a big, you know, big searchlight or, or various uh, different, different kinds of lights. Uh, so I, what, rather than do math on the CPU to figure out where to put those, those planes, I actually just store them in a vertex buffer that's static. Uh, where the positions are just parametric positions inside of a zero to one cube. And the, all the vertex, a vertex shader has to do is take as inputs the, uh, basically the mins and maxes of X, Y, and Z of the view space um, axis align bounding box of that frustum and just basically trilerp that, the data that comes in the VB into those positions. That makes sense. So, like my frontmost plane will have like zero 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 at its bottom, bottom coordinate, right? And that's going to end up in sort of the front bottom left place of my axis align uh, view space bounding volume of that of that frustum. Um, so we just it just naturally let the hardware position those planes every frame, which is kind of nice. Uh, now another really key thing, uh, once we have those planes, uh, so if you look at the diagram here. 
uh, that frustum that, you show, that I've drawn there in black is the light frustum. Uh, the view frustum is not drawn, but the viewer is, say, off to the left there, looking, looking to the right. And those planes are all parallel, uh, or rather perpendicular to the view direction from that viewer. And so those are those planes. We're, we're, we're standing off in another, another, a third place, kind of looking in on the scene. Um, if you think about it, a lot of those sampling, a lot of the pixels that those sampling planes are going to cover uh, are going to be outside of the light frustum. And outside of the light frustum, just by definition here, is black. There's, there's no light going there. Um, so what we do is we use user clip planes to, to clip that geometry. And that's absolutely fundamental. Uh, if you don't do that, this is not implementable. Um, it's worth doing this manually. I mean, it's just 100 quads. You could do the math on the CPU to figure out what those, those polygons should be. It's worth doing that manually if you're on a device that doesn't support user clip planes. Um, or I guess you could just not do this kind of thing. Um, but uh, that is absolutely fundamental. You have to save fill rate. Uh, other, other things you can do as well. This is a side view of a, there's kind of a ground plane there, and the light is up above. And uh, the the volume of the light volume is kind of like pseudo colored, like a kind of a color cube space. Uh, and you can, depending on the, the, uh, what you know about your scene, rather than clip at the far plane of that frustum, just clip at the ground plane instead. Uh, if you think back to Dabashi and Nishita's church scene, uh, you, the, instead of clipping at the front plane of their little frustum, they might have clipped at the wall of the church. Just anything to, to reduce that, that bounding volume of light. Uh, and hence reduce the fill rate of the sampling planes when you draw them. Now, uh, how do we shade those sampling planes when we do draw them for all those pixels that are going to pass the, the clipping tests and really be drawn? Well, there's a number of different terms uh, that we have in our shading equation. First, we have a distance attenuation. I just use a kind of a 1 over d squared term. Um, you can do much more sophisticated things there. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of literature on, on scattering. Uh, atmospheric scattering. I just went with the distance attenuation things. It was simple and it looked fine for me. Um, and I, after that, I do four projective lookups from three different 2D textures. Uh, and you can see those textures along the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, first, there's a cookie. Uh, in, this is just kind of a common term in, in, in lighting design that people use for a little mask that you put in front of a light source to cause it to have some kind of shape. Um, you know, in, in stage lighting or in, or in lighting for film, people might have, you know, whole libraries of different cookies to cause mottled leaves to come down on a scene or a, a big throw of a, a Venetian blind or something just to, to set a scene. Um, so that's kind of where that term comes from. Um, there's also a shadow map. It's a shadow depth map. Um, you can, if you want, use a totally different method for shadowing on the scene. This is just for sh uh, shadowing the sampling planes. Uh, and a tiling noise map that's sampled twice. So it's just a 2D noise, uh, noise texture that's, that tiles that I sample a couple of times and kind of composite together to give a really a nice uh, noisy, noisy look that tends not to look like it really repeats much. Um, you, you have to, um, because you're clipping using user clip planes to the, to the um, light frustum, that handles any back projection. Because if you recall, um, you know, projective texturing will, will also project backwards away from, from your, say, your light source. So because you're, you're clipping, it'll handle any back projection that would possibly occur on your sampling planes. But you need to make sure you handle that in the rest of the way that you draw your scene. Um, and additionally, I have kind of a color mask term that I can use to route some data. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that later. Uh, additionally, you can set the alpha channel to the sum of, of all of these terms. Uh, so that you can alpha test pixels that end up still black, even after potentially adding, um, you know, different different light values from the cookie and from the from the noise and from the shadow test. Uh, some of them will still be masked out, so you want to potentially alpha test those and save some memory bandwidth. Um, as I said, I use some noise textures, and that's to give me a sense of non-uniform particle density. Um, it just gives you kind of a level of interest, and, and also sometimes can, tends to hide some of the aliasing that can occur in this technique. Um, there are two noise terms that are composited together and mu just multiplied with the rest of the terms, like the cookie and the shadow, shadow test. Um, the, uh, the shadow map is, is rendered from the point of view of the light source each frame. Um, and, uh, and, and as I said, not necessarily on the rest of the scene. Uh, if the uh, object and the scene and the light are not animating, you can actually reuse the shadow map every frame. So it, 
uh, you can keep that around if that's a, a potential optimization for your, for your particular scenario. I do that in this app if everything is, if I've stopped animation and I don't need to, to re-update at each frame. So we'll just have a kind of a quick look at the code, just kind of block by block. We're not, not going to go through every little detail here. Uh, but you can see here that the, the first thing I do is I sample the, the cookie texture. And that, that is um, bracketed by an if test on this, this uh, var variable called bcookie. It's just a, and if you look up at the prototype for this function for my pixel shader, you'll see that it's, that's declared as a uni uniform bool. Uh, and what that means is, uh, I can, in a D3DX effect file, uh, I can actually declare a technique uh, and pass uh, values like true and false into my PS main for, say, the pixel shader that's for that particular technique. And with this one PS main, generate a large number of permutations of shaders. So, for example, as I, in my demo, I'm toggling different things on and off. Um, I'm switching between techniques, all of which call this same function. Uh, and the HLSL compiler, uh, since it knows those uniform bools at compile time, will do code specialization and eliminate all that dead code. So, uh, for example, if I turn off the cookie, then I'm going to switch to a different shader that doesn't have the cookie code, and you'll see the frame rate go up, things like that. Uh, after, the, after the cookie, we have another optional block here, the scrolling noise. In this case, we do two, two projective texture samples from our noise textures and composite those together. Just kind of a random little multiplication and scaling kind of thing there that looked good. Um, here's the shadow map sampling and then the test against, against the, the depth to see whether it's in light or not. Um, this is my attenuation, which is kind of scaled for my world, with some, some funny magic constants in there. Uh, and then we have to kind of normalize this as well. I can vary the number of sampling planes that I draw. And then in the code, they're called shells right there, but those are the number of sampling planes. So for example, if I go far away from this light, I can draw fewer sampling planes and, uh, and, uh, and, and hence uh, you know, increase performance in cases where I don't need a lot of detail. And this last little bit here, uh, everything is multiplied also by this thing called channel mask, uh, which allows me to route the, route the data. And I'll explain why I want to do that in a little bit here. Um, so as I said, we're doing a dis discrete approximation to this integral along the ray from, from our eye through a given pixel out into this light volume. Um, naturally, we're sampling, right? We're in, we, when we're drawing these discrete planes, we're going to be sampling that signal effect effectively at some particular rate. Um, and if we're not sampling it at a high enough frequency, then, then uh, we'll, we will get aliasing. So if there's a lot of high spatial frequency in the signal, i.e. a hard shadow map edge, we can get aliasing. So that leads us to want to use a lot of sampling planes, as many as we can, uh, and get away with it performance-wise. So that'll give us a better result in the end. However, we have uh, say, on, on current hardware, the ability only to render into uh, an 8-bit per channel de uh, destination, say, back buffer, um, and still do this additive alpha blending. Uh, and so what that means is that we want to draw as few planes as possible so that each plane has the opportunity to add at least a couple of bits to this sum. Otherwise, we'll get really bad banding. So we have these kind of conflicting goals uh, where we have to kind of trade off between potentially undersampling the volume uh, or having too few bits per, per sample and we'll end up with bad quantization. So you kind of have to balance this off. Uh, in Debashi's paper, they show this figure. Uh, on the left, they've drawn just 15 of their planes uh, and then 30 and then 75. And you can see, obviously, because there's a hard shadow edge, which is a high spatial frequency component to that signal, effectively, and, and it's undersampled, you get this fun funny stair-stepping thing, and that's aliasing. Uh, and as you increase the number of planes, number of samples, uh, you, you get a better and better reconstruction. Uh, one thing you can do to kind of hack at the aliasing problem, uh, depending on the kind of cookie you use, it sometimes tend to, tends to be worse up near the, uh, near the, near the sort of uh, light source. You can increase saturation to sync with your, your um, uh, distance attenuation equation to, to have more saturation up there. Uh, another thing that, that I've done is I've said, OK, fine. I can live with monochrome fog for some cases. Uh, so what I do instead of rendering these sampling planes additively blended onto my, pre my, my scene, I will instead render them to another target and alternate um, which channel I render those planes into. 
So every fourth one will go into red, every fourth one into green, blue, alpha, and so on. I'm still actually making the same number of draw calls, but I use that channel mask variable that I mentioned earlier to essentially route my scalar result into the right one of my red, green, blue, alpha um, channels for each sampling plane. And of course, those are clipped to the frustum as well. And of course, later on, when we composite that stuff over the back buffer, we'll, we'll weave those, those channels, those scalar channels, back together again. Uh, people, lots of people are doing image space glowing and blurring. Um, clearly, this thing uh, integrates with that very nicely. If you look in uh, Splinter Cell, you'll see a lot of that kind of thing. It looks particularly nice together. Obviously, this is more light coming back at your eye. This will potentially blur as well. And of course, more blurring helps hide the, potentially the aliasing you get with this technique. So some advice for, for using this. Um, uh, it helps if you don't ha end up with your uh, light frustum really spanning a large extent in your view, in view space, a large sort of depth extent, because um, you kind of sp spread out uh, your sampling that way and undersample the volume potentially. Um, for, for, for performance reasons, if it's nice if you can keep the cone nice and tight. Think about the flashlights at the beginning of ET, if you remember seeing that as a kid. And all you see are the flashlights zinging around the, the forest there. It's a really cool, dramatic element. Um, and you could, you could easily do that in real time with this technique. A low spatial frequency cookie tends to look nice. So these Venetian blinds and this really detailed rose stained glass window in the top are difficult. Uh, in the middle, you start to get to better stuff. Actually, the bottom is even better. Um, for the case where you're rendering directly into your back buffer, not doing this channel interleaving thing that I was talking about before, um, you're, for a given ray, you're, you're not likely to um, hit the same color channel twice for a cookie that looks like that, right? Because different sort of different shafts that are going to come down from the light source are different colors. So you, you tend to be able to add more bits to your dest destination buffer per sampling plane and not get quantization problems. Um, that's kind of that's a really neat, neat look. I, I love that particular cookie. It looks it looks really really sweet. Um, so, um, but before since I've gone through all the lighting terms there, let me actually go over to the demo again and show you show you them sort of with and without and what they what they kind of add to the add to the whole the whole lighting equation. So here we have our scene. Uh, I'll just kind of freeze the light so you can see what's going on. It's kind of a simple scene. If you look at the ground there, you can kind of see the, the noise uh, modulating on, on the ground as, as well as, of course, causing these neat streaks uh, along the light shafts themselves. Um, the model is being rendered into a shadow depth map that you can see here. If I let the light keep going, you'll see that that's dynamic. And, uh, and of course, that is being projected onto the sampling planes as well. So if I turn that off, you, you know, it still looks like a volumetric thing. Um, you know, maybe on its own it looks good, but you really need those shadows to give the nice dramatic look uh, if you're going to have objects interacting in that space. Um, the noise is nice. Um, I'll, I'll turn that off and give you, give you um, like a, just kind of a uniform look. I mean, it definitely looks volumetric, but it has a whole lot more character when you have the, the noise in there. Okay, so that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. And I hope you can tell that the frame rates are actually pretty nice here. Um, and this is rendering pretty fast, 40-something here. Um, if I freeze it, if I turn off, start turning off some of these terms, you'll see that um, definitely this is, this is a totally fill-bound kind of thing. Um, the, the, the complexity of the pixel shader and sampling all those textures and things is completely where your performance is. So uh, what, what do you do to optimize this? You've got to focus on fill. So first, minimize the number of sampling planes if you can. Uh, minimize the number of pixels shaded. Uh, you, can, you can obviously do the clipping and, and things like that now. Um, there's some, some interesting tests that were done by uh, Jens Kruger in a recent IEEE Viz paper that could potentially optimize some of this as well. A uh, really neat ray casting technique that he has. That he uses the... Um, the high Z functionality in, in today's chips. And of course, just minimize the cost of the pixel shader. As you could see, when I turned off the noise and the shadows and things, the perf went way up. 
Uh, and minimize, you can also minimize the number of pixels written out, but that may end up help, uh, hurting more than helping just because of the interactions of alpha test and early Z. Uh, other simple obvious things, uh, partitioning the light shafts. So for example, in this scene we've got two shafts coming down. The one on the right, maybe we know in advance that it's not going to cast a shadow because there's nothing there. Uh, and on the left we know that the shadow is not going to be interesting until you get down to some, you know, height in the room. So you could partition those shafts. The one on the right, don't use a shadow map. The one on the left, draw it basically twice. Um, you know, there, there's no geometry cost to this thing, right? We're drawing 100 quads. Um, it's all in the fill. So if you use your clip planes properly, you could, you could optimize this by partitioning those spaces. So what are the pros and cons of this? Uh, the pros are that it's kind of inherently soft. You know, you're, you're projecting these nice soft cookies and things down onto there, nice soft noise. Uh, it's, it's easy to fake non-uniform density because you're projecting that noise down there, uh, which is something that you really can't do with the sort of hull-based techniques. Uh, another thing you can't do with those techniques is get non-uniform color like stained glass and so on. Cons are that it is fill rate heavy. Uh, the cost of the shadow map rendering pass, of course, because you're, you know, that's something else that you're, you have to have to do before you project onto these planes. The uh, shadow map filtering cost can, you know, can potentially be heavy. Um, I was just doing actually one pick nearest sample there, which is why I was getting a, like, a pretty hard shadow edge, which was causing some aliasing. Uh, high fill rate required, uh, and you could end up undersampling the volume by drawing too few uh, pla planes or quantization errors due to having too few bits to devote to each plane, and by the way, it requires a lot of fill. So in the future, as I mentioned before, there's some better scattering models that we can use. Uh, better shadow map filtering is really an obvious one. That might even let us reduce the number of planes that we have, and we can maybe trade off that cost there. Um, virtual subplanes is something that, uh, that you could potentially do. Uh, both, actually, both the virtual subplane idea and the interleaved sampling come from a paper by Keller and Heydrich called interleaved sampling, uh, where you can, you can A, sort of sample multiple times in the volume per sampling plane, because you have these complex pixel shaders. You could walk a little bit along that ray and evaluate a few more times, right? Uh, additionally, uh, you can offset the place that you start along that ray for neighboring pixels on the screen, and that gives you kind of a, a, kind of a dithered effect, actually, which helps hide these quantization uh, and aliasing uh, artifacts. And that, that's a cool paper. I, I encourage you to read that. And in fact, here are all the references. Uh, and these slides are available online, I think, already on ATI.com slash developer.